let's continue our preparation for the CUNY assessment test. You will be expected on the assessment test to be able to pick out the smallest or the largest number from a group of fractions. Let's look at an example. Two eighths, one eighth, seven eighths, four eighths, three eighths. This is a particularly easy example because all of the fractions have the same denominator. When they all have the same denominator, the smallest fraction is the one with the smallest numerator, and the largest fraction is the one with the largest numerator. So in this group of fractions, 1 8 is the smallest, 7 8 is the largest. But what made this particularly easy is that they all had the same denominator. So the smallest numerator determined the smallest fraction, the largest numerator determined the largest fraction. However, on the assessment test, the fractions will probably have different denominators. Okay, if fractions have different denominators and you want to determine which one is smaller, let's say 2 thirds or 3 quarters, which is smaller? One thing you might do is turn these into equivalent fractions having the same denominator and then compare as we did over there. If we want to turn two-thirds and three-quarters into fractions having the same denominator, well, the lowest common denominator here would be 12. We would like to change two-thirds into an equivalent fraction having denominator 12 and three-quarters as well. Remembering the fundamental principle of fractions, we can multiply both the numerator and the denominator of a fraction by the same non-zero number, and we will get an equivalent fraction. Okay? We would like to turn thirds into twelfths. Now, to accomplish that, we would have to multiply the denominator by four. If we multiply the denominator by four, this would be twelve. We'd have to multiply the numerator by four as well, so this would be eight. Two-thirds is equivalent to eight twelfths. Over here, to change fourths into twelfths, we would have to multiply by three. Since we want to multiply the denominator by three to get an equivalent fraction, we will have to multiply the numerator by three as well. Four times three is twelve, three times three is nine. So two-thirds is equivalent to eight twelfths, and three-quarters is equivalent to nine twelfths. And in that way, we see certainly that two-thirds is smaller than three-quarters because eight twelfths is less than nine twelfths. Two-thirds is less than three-quarters. Remembering this symbol from a previous tape, this is a symbol for less than, is less than. Two-thirds is less than three-quarters because eight-twelfths is less than nine-twelfths. Actually, since the denominators were the same, 12, what really made the difference was the fact that 8 was less than 9. And if we look over here, we notice that the numerator on this fraction is 2 and the denominator on this fraction is 4. And we see that if we had cross-multiplied, we would have gotten 2 times 4 here. And here, cross-multiplying, we would have gotten 3 times 3. And it can be shown that 2 thirds is less than 3 quarters if 2 times 4 is less than 3 times 3 which means if 8 is less than 9. Okay, so another way of handling this would be the following. We can make use of this rule. A over B is less than C over D if A times D is less than B times C. We're assuming here that all of the numbers A, B, C, and D are positive. A, B, C, D are positive, in fact, positive integers is what you're going to be dealing with. A, B, C, and D are positive integers. Then we can say that one fraction is less than the other. A over B is less than C over D if we cross multiply and A times D is less than B times C. Looking at the example we had worked out before, two-thirds is less than three quarters since two times four is less than three times three. Eight was less than nine. Okay, this is a short way of handling the problem. 
it can be, it's basically equivalent to getting the lowest common denominator, actually using as the lowest common denominator the product of the denominators. In this case, that was the lowest common denominator. In other cases, you could still combine over the product of the denominators. And then determining which is smaller by which has a smaller numerator. Okay? So 2 thirds was less than 3 quarters since 2 times 4 is less than 3 times 3. And in general, that'll be easier than actually doing the work of combining over the lowest common denominator. Okay, let's try an example. Very often on the assessment test, you'll be given a group of five fractions and asked to pick out the smallest, or as I said, the largest. Okay, let's try this. Which of these fractions is the smallest? A, B, C, D, E. Let's use for A, 5, 6. For B, 7 eighths. For C, 2 thirds. For D, 3 fifths. And for E, 3 quarters. Okay, what we're going to do is compare A with B. Find the smaller of these two. And we have that and move on and take the smaller of those two and compare it to C. Find the smaller of those. And in that way, going down the line, we'll be able to find the smallest of the five fractions. Okay, so what I'm going to start off with is 5, 6, and 7 eighths. And I'm curious to see if this is less than or not. So I'm going to start off with a question mark. I don't know if it's less than or greater than. And I'm going to do the cross multiplication. 5 times 8, and here seven, uh, 6 times 7. And we get that 5 times 8 is 40. 6 times 7 is 42. 40 is less than 42. And when I know that, then I can go back on top here and say that 5, 6 is less than 7 eighths. Okay, so the first thing I did was compare fraction A with fraction B. 5, 6 turned out to be less than 7 eighths because 5 times 8 was less than 6 times 7. Remembering this rule over here, 5, 6 was less than 7 eighths because 5 times 8 was less than 6 times 7. Please remember to start the cross multiplication with the number in the upper left-hand corner. In other words, with the fraction on the left's numerator. It has to be done in that way. 5 times 8 is less than 6 times 7, so therefore 5, 6 is less than 7 eighths. So between A and B, I'm looking for the smallest. 5, 6 is less than 7 eighths, so we can ignore 7 eighths. It's obviously not going to be the smallest. 5, 6 is already less than 7 eighths. Let's now compare 5, 6 with 2 thirds. OK, cross multiplying. 5 times 3 is to be compared with uh, 6 times 2, or 2 times 6. 15 is greater than 12, which means 5, 6 is greater than 2 thirds. Or you could think of it either 5, 6 is greater than 2 thirds, or 2 thirds is less than 5, 6. 2 thirds is now known to be less than 5 6, which means 5 6 could not be the smallest. It's now out of the running. We will now compare 2 thirds with 3 fifths and continue on in that way. You just write down what the choices are again here. Five, six, seven eighths, two thirds, three fifths, and three quarters. We have already shown that five six is less than seven eighths, 
which meant 7 eighths was out. And we have shown that 2 thirds is less than 5 six, so 5 six is out. So, so far, this is the smallest. We will now compare 2 thirds with 3 fifths. Starting the cross multiplication from the number in the upper left hand corner, 2 times 5 is to be compared 3 times 3. 10 is greater than 9, which means that the direction would be this way. 2 thirds is greater than 3 fifths, or 3 fifths is less than 2 thirds. Since 3 fifths is less than 2 thirds, 2 thirds is now out of the running for the smallest, leaving us to compare 3 fifths with 3 quarters. 3 fifths is to be compared with 3 quarters. Cross multiplying 3 times 4 is to be compared with 5 times 3. 12 is less than 15, so we know that 3 fifths is less than 3 quarters, and therefore 3 quarters is out, and the smallest in this group of fractions is 3 fifths. By the way, I just want to mention that if you do want to combine over the least common denominator, that is a possibility. Okay, in this particular problem, the least common denominator, the smallest number, so that 6, 8, 3, 5, and 4, all are factors of this number, would be 120. And if you wanted to, you could rewrite each of these fractions by an equivalent fraction having denominator 120. Okay, if you do that, 5, 6 can be turned into 1 20th by saying I multiply the denominator by 20, I multiply the numerator by 20 as well, it's 100 over 120. Similarly, 8, to get to 120, we would have to multiply the denominator by uh, 15. So we'll also multiply the numerator by 15 as well. 7 times 15 will give us 105. And here, to get 120, we would multiply the denominator by 40. We'll multiply the numerator by 40 as well. 80 over 120. Here, we'll multiply the denominator by 24 to get 120. We'll multiply the numerator by 24 as well. And that will give us 72. And finally, we'd have to multiply the denominator here by 30, multiplying the numerator by 30 as well. Now we have five fractions, all with the same denominator, and therefore the smallest numerator determines the smallest fraction. And of course, 3 fifths is still the answer. So if you feel more comfortable with this, go ahead. However, this is also an option, another way of handling the problem. But more than likely, you will get one of these problems on the exam. Let's try another example of these fractions is the largest. And please pay attention to the question. It would be a shame to go through all this trouble of having combined over the same denominator, and then they ask for the largest, and you give them the smallest. So please. Pay attention to the words. Is it the smallest they're asking for or the largest? Okay, and let's try again five fractions. Seven eighths, thirteen sixteenths, eight ninths, uh, ten thirteenths, and nine-tenths. So once again, we'll start by comparing A to B, this time looking for the largest, and crossing out the small ones that we come across on the way. Okay, seven-eighths is to be compared to thirteen-sixteenths. So seven times sixteen has to be compared with thirteen times eight. 
Okay, 7 times 16 is 112. 13 times 8 is 104. 112 is larger than 104, so 7 eighths is greater than 13 sixteenths, which means since we're looking for the largest, we will cross off 13 sixteenths. 7 eighths is larger than that. And we will now move down the line and compare this time 7 eighths to 8 ninths. Okay, cross multiplying, 7 times 9 is com to be compared to 8 times 8. 7 times 9 is 63, 8 times 8 is 64, 63 is less than 64, 7 eighths is less than 8 ninths, or 8 ninths is greater than 7 eighths. Since 8 ninths is greater than 7 eighths, we will now cross 7 eighths off. We are looking for the largest. Okay, 7 eighths was bigger than the 13 sixteenths, so we eliminated that. But now 8 ninths in turn is bigger than the 7 eighths. So we eliminate the 7 eighths. So, so far, C is the largest. Now we will compare 8 ninths, going down the list, to 10 thirteenths. 8 times 13 is to be compared to 10 times 9. 8 times 13 is 104. 10 times 9 is 90. 104 is greater than 90. So 8 ninths is greater than 10 thirteenths. And we can eliminate 10 thirteenths from the running for the largest. Okay, so last we have to compare 8 ninths with 9 tenths. 8 ninths to be compared with 9 tenths. Cross multiplying, 8 times 10 and 9 times 9 are to be compared. 80 is less than 81, so 8 ninths is less than 9 tenths, or 9 tenths, going the other way, is bigger than 8 ninths. If 9 tenths is bigger than 8 ninths, 8 ninths is out of the running, and this is now the correct choice for the largest fraction in that group. Sometimes you are asked to pick out the largest or the smallest number from a group of numbers, but the numbers, instead of being written as fractions, are written as decimals. Okay, we have to understand how to compare the, size, the sizes of decimal numbers. Now, if we have a pure decimal number, that would be a number that has no digits to the left of the decimal point, then our technique will be to compare the first digit to the right of the decimal point. If they are the same, Okay, well, if they're different, the smaller digit will determine the smaller decimal. If they are the same, we will move on to the second digit, to the right of the decimal point. Let's look at an example. Say we want to compare 0.24 with 0.32. We want to know which is larger. These are pure decimal numbers. In other words, no number to the left of the decimal point. So we start by looking at the first number to the right of the decimal point. Since 2 is less than 3, we will say that 0.24 is less than 0.32. On the other hand, if we had, say, 0.24 to be compared with 0.21, since the first digit to the right of the decimal point is the same, okay, they're both twos, we move to the second digit to the right of the decimal point. Since 4 is greater than 1, 0.24 is greater than 0.21. This is similar in a sense to the way we alphabetize words. For example, to put them in a dictionary, if we have, say, A-B-L-E and A-B-O-U-T, and we want to put them in alphabetical order, 
If the first letters are the same, we ignore them, we move to the second letters. If the second letters are the same, we ignore them, we move to the third letters. Since L comes before O in the alphabet, able would appear in the dictionary before about. And the same kind of ordering here. We look at the first digits to the right of the decimal point. If they are the same, we move to the second digits. As soon as they're no longer the same, the larger digit, okay, determines the larger decimal number. Okay, let's try another one. What about point O two one and point O O three? The zeros are the same, but since two is greater than zero, point O two one must be greater than point O O three. By the way, from one of an earlier videotape, we learned that point O two one is read twenty one thousandths, and it can be written as twenty one over one thousand. This is three thousandths, three over a thousand, and since these are two fractions with the same denominator, the larger numerator does determine that this is the larger fraction. Twenty one over a thousand is larger than three over a thousand. Okay, now you can change decimals to fractions to help you to compare. By the way, you can also change fractions to decimals. And another way of handling the last problem that we worked out, let's go back over to this last problem that we'd looked at. Which of these fractions is the largest? Okay, what you can do, another method of handling this problem, if you prefer, is to find the decimal representation for each of these fractions. When I see 7 eighths, okay, 7 eighths means 7 divided by eighths. Okay, so I just want to point out another way of handling this problem. Okay, very often in mathematics there's more than one correct way to do a problem. 7 eighths means 7 divided by 8. When you're doing a division like this, you find the decimal point here, and you, in the answer, the decimal point will appear in the same spot, right over that. And how many times does 8 go into 7? It doesn't. How many times does 8 go into 70? It goes in 8 times. 8 times 8, 64. Subtract, set 10, take away 4 is 6, bring down the next. How many times does 8 go into 60? 7 times 56. Subtract 4. 40, bring down the next 0. How many times does 8 go into 40? 5 times, and then it's 40, and there's no remainder. So this is 0.875. In a similar way, we can write decimal representations for all of these fractions. We just want, and you might want to stop the machine and try each of these. Okay? 13 sixteenths can be written as point 0.8125. It may go on after that, but I'm just, you know, writing down a few digits for each one for the comparison. 8 ninths is point 0.888. Keeps repeating. 10 thirteenths is point 0.769. 9 tenths, of course, is 0.9, and that's it. So if for the purpose of comparison, you might want to put some more zeros in there. Now, which of these is the largest? Well, we look at the first digit to the right of the decimal point. This is an 8, an 8, an 8, a 7, a 9, and of course, automatically, this becomes the largest. That's another way of handling the problem that we tackled earlier, using the idea of changing the fractions to the decimals. And remember, for the purpose of comparisons, you might have to, in this case, you really didn't have to, but sometimes you might have to add zeros to the right of a decimal representation which terminates. If we are dealing with a mixed, instead of a pure decimal number, a mixed decimal number, a number that has digits to the left and to the right of the decimal point. And the first thing we will do is compare the numbers to the left of the decimal point, the integer parts of the numbers. Okay, for example, 2.4 and 3.7. 
Okay, these are not pure decimals, they are mixed. In other words, we have two and four tenths, three and seven tenths. First, compare the numbers to the left of the decimal point. Okay, if they're not the same, the smaller one will determine the smaller number. So 2.4 is less than 3.7 since 2 is less than 3. Two point one three to be compared to two point three five. Since the numbers to the left of the decimal point are the same, they're both two, then we continue by moving to the right of the decimal point, comparing the first digit. One is less than three, and therefore two point one three is less than two point three five. Two point three four to be compared to 2.31. We look first to the left of the decimal point. The twos are the same. And we move to the right of the decimal point. The first digit to the right of the decimal point is three. They're the same. So then we compare the second digits to the right of the decimal point. Since four is bigger than one, 2.34 is bigger than 2.31. Okay, let's finish off with this example on this topic, and we'll move to something else. Which number is the smallest? Which number is the largest? And the choices are A, B, C, D, E point. 0303.0330.0320.0280.0031. OK, if you want to, of course, when, when the decimal terminates like that, you could put another zero in so they all have the same number of digits. We start, there's no numbers to the left of the decimal point. We start with the first digit to the right of the decimal point. They're all zeros, okay? We move to the second digit to the right of the decimal point. Since we have a three, a three, a three, a two, and a three, this is the smallest, okay? We're now trying to find the largest the remaining four all agree in the first two decimal digits, so we move to the third decimal digit. We're looking now for the largest. We have the third decimal digit, zero, three, two, one. The largest is the three, so therefore this is the largest number in the group. 0 0.030 is the largest, 0 0.0280 is the smallest. If you were to multiply each of these numbers by a thousand, excuse me, by ten thousand, you would be able to move the decimal in each case four digits to the right. And you would have the numbers 303, 330, 320, 280, and 310. Okay, this idea is only good if they all have the same number of decimal digits. And you can basically ignore the decimal point and then say 280 is the smallest of the numbers. 330 is the largest of the numbers. But please be careful on this, because if I had just a 0.07 here in this group, okay, I wouldn't want you to just treat this as 7. Okay? I would want you to treat it as 0.0700. And therefore, when you multiplied by 10,000, this would come out to be 700, and it would be the largest. So don't get confused here. Please remember that if you're going to use that idea, it's all right if you want to use it. Okay, to basically ignore the decimal point and just look at the number itself. But first, make sure they all have the same number of digits. I don't want you to look at just 0.07 and say it's a 7. Think of it as a 700. So if you're going to use that plan, first make sure they all have the same number of digits. And if they all have the same number of digits, you can basically, the same number of decimal digits, you can basically ignore the decimal point and then pick the... 280 is the smallest of the numbers, and 330 is the largest of the numbers. Okay, the next kind of problem 
that we may come to on the assessment test would be a problem involving addition and subtraction of decimal numbers. These problems are not hard to handle if you already know how to add and subtract whole numbers. The important thing is to simply line up the decimal digits and add zeros if they're necessary for any of the numbers. And then you add or subtract in the columns. Let us try. For example, if you wanted to add 0.23 and 0.55, OK? We line up the decimal points. We put this decimal point in the same spot in the answer under the common decimal point. Then we add up the numbers as if there were no decimal points. 3 plus 5, 8. 2 plus 5, 7. So we get 0.78. OK, by the way, 0.23 is really 23 hundredths. 0.55 is 55 hundredths. When you add fractions that have the same denominator, you combine the numerators, so you would get 78 hundredths, which of course is 0.78. So that's sort of just, that sort of seem, seems to think, say that we're doing the right thing here. Let us uh, try another problem. Very often on the assessment test, you're given the problem written uh, horizontally. Let's say add 6.31 plus 12.05 plus 9.76. And you first have to start by rewriting the problem so that the numbers are lined up with the decimal points under each other. 12.05, 9.76. Okay. Make sure that the decimal points all line up and then put the decimal point in the same spot in the answer. And then add basically in columns as if there were no decimal points. 1 plus 5, 6, and 6, 12. Put down the 2, carry the 1. 1 plus 3, 4, and 7, 11. Put down the 1, carry the 1. 1 plus 6, 7, and 2, 9, and 9, 18. Put down the 8, carry the 1. 1 plus 1, 2. So 28.12, 28 and 12 hundredths. And you would then look for that answer in the multiple choice. OK, let's try another problem. Actually, this one is more uh, similar to the ones you'd be seeing on the assessment test, where the numbers that you have to add have different numbers of decimal digits. Add 15.95 plus 6.034 plus 3. Three, of course, okay, this is the way it would be written. You would line them up 15.95, 6.034. Three should be thought of as three point. Okay, if you have a number, the decimal point is not specified, then it appears right after the number. Okay, you can leave it like this, or if you want, you can put some zeros and you can treat this as 3.000 and 15.950 if it makes you feel more comfortable with the columns. The important thing is to add them up in the columns. 0 plus 4 plus 0 is 4, 5 plus 3 8, 9 plus 0 plus 0, the decimal point under all the other decimal points. 5 plus 6, 11 plus 3, 14. Put down the 4, carry the 1, 1 plus 1, 2. 24.984. We're going to finish off this videotape by a few subtraction problems involving decimals. And basically the same kind of idea, we're going to have to line up our decimal points. Okay, let us start. Subtract uh, 30.7, take away 3.75. Here it becomes very important to add the extra zeros, which was sort of optional in the addition problem. 30 
0.7 take away 3.75. First thing I'm going to do is to write this as 30.70. In the answer, the decimal point will appear right under all the other decimal points. And now we can basically do the subtraction as if we were subtracting whole numbers. OK. We can't take 5 from 0, so we're going to borrow from this column here. We'll turn this into a 6. And 10, 10 take away 5 is 5. We can't take 7 from 6, so we're going to borrow from here. So this 30 will be turned into a 29, and we'll now make this a 16. 16 take away 7 will give us 9. 9 take away 3, 6. 2 take away 0, 2. 26.95. OK, remember this can be checked. by adding up your answer and what you were subtracting. And if you've done it correctly, you should get what you started with. 5 and 5, 10. 1 plus 9, 10. And 7, 17. 7 and 3, 10, 3. So here we have the 30.7 that we started with. Another subtraction problem. 12.8 take away 3.604. 12.8 take away 3.604. We will add in two zeros here to finish off the columns. And we will start our subtraction. Can't take the 4 from the 0, so we're going to borrow from here. We'll change this 80 into 79, make this a 10. 10 take away 4 will be 6. 9 take away 0, 9. 7 take away 6, 1. Here, 12 take away 3, 9. 9.196. And as I said, you can check this by adding 9.196. 196 with what you were subtracting, 3.604. You should get what you started with, the 12.8. 4 and 6, 10. 1 and 9, 10. 6 and 2, 8. 3 plus 9, 12. 12.8, 12 so it checks out. And as our last example on this videotape, let's try this subtraction. 12.7 take away 3.502. 12.7 take away 3.502. Adding in the extra zeros and putting the decimal point into the answer and then proceeding as if we were really subtracting whole numbers. OK, 2 from 0 we can't do, so we're going to borrow 1 from here. 70 will be turned into 69, and this will be a 10. 10 take away 2, that's 8. 9 take away 0, that's 9. 6 take away 5 is 1. 12 take away 3, 9. So we get a final answer of 9.198. And we can check that. 9.198 plus what we were subtracting, 3.502, adding them up, 2 plus 8, 10, 1 plus 9, 10, 5 plus 1 plus 1, 7, 3 plus 9, 12. So we get 12.7 as an answer, which checks out with what we started with. So our answer is 9.198, and that brings us to the end of this videotape.